fact, I saw this ballet first when I was five or six, right. and I've seen it then probably 300 times. Uh, so I was very surprised when I learned much later that the B major at the end uh, signifies the, the death of the protagonist. Mm. And, and they are, in the original libretto, they are greeted on the bottom of the lake by the um, mermaids and naiads, etc. And And yeah. of course, there, there was always a question, what happens to the evil? Does evil die as well? Um, but that, that, that wasn't very clear. But for the original libretto, which Tchaikovsky composed to, there was um, very clearly um, and the absence of happy end. And I mm -hmm. think Tchaikovsky insisted on it because, you know, he, he was trying to write an opera called uh, Undine yeah. on this German, right. German fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And then he abandoned the opera because some of his friends told him, look, this is not a subject for an opera, would be much better subject for ballet. Mm -hmm. So when he was asked by the Bolshoi to write a ballet, he insisted on it being a fantastical ballet from um, the medieval times. So he basically forced upon the Bolshoi his preferred libretto. And uh, the artistic administrator of the Bolshoi, Begichev, wrote the libretto following the wishes of Tchaikovsky. And there was a big confusion uh, for years because everyone thought the libretto was prepared by someone called Geltzer. Or right. Geltzer because Geltzer was the owner of the only surviving copy of this libretto. And his name was on it. And because Geltzer's daughter became quite a famous ballerina later on, so they thought Geltzer was the author of a libretto, but he never, he never wrote any librettos. It was Begichev who actually commissioned Tchaikovsky with the ballet and to whom Tchaikovsky confessed all his wishes. So right. the libretto was kept really strictly adhering to, to the wishes of Tchaikovsky. Right. And then came this choreographer, Wenzel Reisinger, who did the first version, which turned out to be a minor success or almost a fiasco. So that was 1877. When re the version was revived in 1880, Joseph Hansen, the Belgian choreographer, has done yeah. it. And Hansen was the first one who introduced the swan-like movement ah. of the arms. That was wow. the first time, not, not in the first version. Gosh, that's interesting. But this is all still pre-Swan Lake because what yeah. we call the original Swan Lake was created only much later, two years oh. after Tchaikovsky died. Right. So Tchaikovsky had absolutely no part in it. Mm. He, it was Petipa and Ivanov yeah. who, having collaborated with Tchaikovsky already on Nutcracker, on The Sleeping Beauty. Then they looked upon this first not very successful ballet and said, okay, let, we'll, we'll, we'll make it successful. Mm. But in order to make it successful, they tore it apart mm -hmm. and reassembled it anew. That's right. So it's, I would have been interesting to hear the actual original version, how, how was it put together? But this is exactly what you're going to hear in our performance. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, the, because I find it very, very touching and funny when, when um, people speak about the original uh, Swan Lake, and they always mean Petit Pas 1895. Mm -hmm. but the original Swan Lake is rising a Tchaikovsky 1877 and not St. Petersburg, Moscow. Right. Moscow ha had the premiere. I've got, I've got this book here. Right. Which was issued for the Tchaikovsky's 140th birthday. Um, it's the complete materials from the Bolshoi, including the photographs, including the precise description of the costumes. Cool. Um, including their cost and the material from which they were made. Gosh. And it also includes something which, which I find rather uh, remarkable. It's called Repetiteur, which was 
prepared from the original score. It's a basic. It's basically a reduction of the whole music of the ballet for two violins, because in that uh, period of time they didn't rehearse to a piano. There were no pianos. Oh my god! Of and course, pianos existed, but they were not non-existent in in ballet classes. They had two violinists from the orchestra who performed the whole music on two violins. Oh my goodness. So the composer had to deliver the score to the theater and then they commissioned the specialist to write this violin repetiteur. And this violin repetiteur is in exactly the same order in which Tchaikovsky uh, wrote the ballet, which means the black swan pas de deux exists as music, but it's there is no black swan there. It, it's it's in um, Act One. Yeah, it right. In Act One, um, and in Act Three, instead of this, there is a piece of music which Tchaikovsky wrote himself, but which was only performed once during his lifetime. It's so-called Sobichanskaya pas de deux. Sobichanskaya was the second performer of um, Odette. Let me find her picture. And did she did she say I need a little pas de deux? <laughs> well, she she was she, it was it was very very funny actually because she she was very famous, Sobyshanska, and she didn't trust uh, this little known composer, P. Yes. <laughs> I. Tchaikovsky, and didn't trust the cho choreographer Reisinger. So there she is. That's that's her picture can you see it oh wow yes 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 and that's the first uh, swan dress that's how the swans looked in back in 18 yes so yeah. she, she went to st petersburg to visit her friend petit pa and told him uh, i want you to create a pas de deux for me and he said fine and she told me i want you to to deliver the music for it as well not compose it but ask your friend minkus he's doing it <laughs> He will, he will write me the pas de deux. Uh, when Tchaikovsky heard of it, he got slightly worried, to put it mildly, and said, no, 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 that doesn't work like this. This is my ballet, and good or bad, I want to be in charge of it. So I will write a pas de deux for you. And she said, well, but, but the pas de deux has been created. The steps are there, and I, I don't go to St. Petersburg for a second time. I said, no, no problem. Just show me the pas de deux and show me the music. And I will create my own music, which would be exactly in the same, at the same speed, in the same meter. It would have the same amount of bars. You wouldn't need to re-rehearse it. You will just perform what you have learned, but to my music. Wow. <laughs> and this is what Tchaikovsky own what's Tchaikovsky's own Black Swan Pas de Deux. It only became known in Soviet times because the score of it didn't survive. They performed it once and the score was destroyed. So all that remained was the piano reduction and the violin repetiteur. I see. So in Soviet times, um, Burmeister, who I mentioned earlier, yes. has commissioned the Russian composer Vissarion Shebalin, who taught at the conservatory, he was friend of Shostakovich, right. to orchestrate it. And Shebalin orchestrated it. So in Burmeister's version, that pas de deux was sitting in Act Three. Right. Tchaikovsky wrote two extra numbers, for, especially for the Sobyshansky. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pas de deux yeah. and the Russian dance. Right. Right. Originally, Russian dance wasn't there. So when they performed it in 1877, they had the ballet consisting of 52 numbers, just as Tchaikovsky wrote it. To be precise, that was February 1877. In April 77, Sobichanska danced Odette. And in that performance, they added the Russian and they added the pas de deux. Mm -hmm. In 1880, Hansen revived it, changed the dances partly, but left the structure as it was. 
and it mm -hmm. was already without the Sobichansk pas de deux and without the Russian. Okay. And then in 1895 came Petit Pas and the whole thing started anew. Yeah. But since Petit Pas uh, version, very few people have actually heard what Tchaikovsky composed in the first place. I had the luck of uh, seeing a version of the ballet, which was a completely new, newly choreographed. Everything was new. Right. Um, from, from beginning to end. Yeah. And yet it was based upon the original score. There was not a single cut and there was not a single uh, swap between the numbers. So the numbers were exactly as Tchaikovsky wrote them. That was the version by German yeah. choreographer Tom Schilling. But that was the first time that I'm, I, I heard the original score. And I must say, since that day, I, I had this like an obsession that this is how the score should be played. And one of the big dreams I had during my time with the LPO that one day we would perform this original version and also find a choreographer who would be courageous enough to create something completely new. Because I still don't understand how it is possible that we live with this only one classical rendition of this piece, which dates back. So 125 years ago, it was created mm -hmm. and that no one ever has the courage of creating something new. While in the world of opera, uh, imagine someone putting on a Verdi opera with the uh, regie or with the stage directions of uh, 1870s. People would laugh at, at this person. It's not possible. Or try to, to stage a play by Ibsen in the staging of Ibsen's time, or Chekhov in the in the in the staging of Stanislavski, it's yeah. pure museum, isn't it? Absolutely. The only thing is that, of course, we, you have to keep in mind that our, our words. So you know, it's a little bit like creating a whole new orchestration for Swan Lake would be the same idea as changing the steps, and because the steps are the are the kind of stage management. If you know what I mean, you can change bits and bobs, but you can't quite change the nature of the movement per se. So I know what you mean. And I often have thought exactly the same. How come that, you know, the opera has this, um, you know, complete new visions of old work. And we we are stuck with sort of, you know, the 18th uh, vision. But it's, it's all in the nature of the steps in the end. It's a bit, as you say, Ibsen. If they change the wording, it, it would not be an Ibsen play anymore. There is, uh, there is one additional problem there, which few people consider. When Tchaikovsky was creating the ballet, I mean, he wrote it within a year, between 1875 and 1876, but he wrote it, he wrote the music before any choreography was created. Mm. So they had to invent the choreography to the already existing music. Mm. When composing a piece of music, composer usually has a more or less clear idea of the speed at which the piece would go. Some composers may even set a, a metronome mark to, to make their ideas clear. Mm. With Tchaikovsky, there are no metronome marks. There are only word indications in Italian, like andante, moderato, Adagio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But knowing Tchaiko other Tchaikovsky's works, his vocabulary is pretty much the same in the ballet and in the opera and in the symphonies. Uh, right. You can you can deduce more more or less the speed at which the piece should go. So if you look at the score of um, Swan Lake, let's take something very famous like the the, the White Swan and uh, Adagio, Pas de Deux from Act yeah. Two. Uh, first of all, there is no word adagio in the music. It says andante, and andante in Italian means yeah. the walking pace, andante sostenuto. And the andante sostenuto for Tchaikovsky would be something like... Tom.
Now, have you ever seen anyone dancing it at this speed? No, too fast. <laughs> yes. But if, yeah. I, if I close my eyes and listen to the music without seeing the movements, I'd say it's unbearably slow. It kills the music. Yeah. Trying to perform any classical piece of music, be it by Mozart and Beethoven, with this difference in speed, and people will say, you're out of your mind. You're yeah. killing the music. So <laughs> I know I'm stepping on a very thin ice now. <laughs> I am going to completely undo the tempo structure of the classical ballet in our performance. Mm. And I want to prove that, that what Tchaikovsky wrote is a much better piece than mm -hmm. what we've got. With all due respect to the classical choreography and you know, my, myself coming from a family where the, the word classical dances, I, I know it and, and for me it, it, it is you know, a, a point of adoration and reverence, but I still think that music comes first. Like in Chekhov or in Ibsen, the words of the composer came before the stage directions of the choreographer. I see it, I see it differently. I, for me, the words are in the music. And actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the words. This, you, you, see, you, you said our words are the movements. But if you look at the score, if you listen to it, you can hear the voices of Odette, you can hear the voice of Siegfried, because not in the set dances, not in the set numbers, but there are the so-called scenes. For instance, uh, remember the, the first moment when Odette arrives after this scene with the swans. The, the, the big scene where all the swans awake. And, yeah. and then she arrives and then there is this oboe solo. It's a recitative. It's yeah. a recitative. It's like a recitative in the opera. You could put words under, underneath. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the, at the uh, back to White Swan Pas de Deux. Ta -di -ram, pa -pi, pa -pi, pa had text underneath because it was originally composed for the Undine, for the opera. <gasps> and it was a duet of soprano Undine, right. and tenor, the prince. So the cello is the prince and soprano <laughs> Undine. And I conducted it and th there is a text in Russian. Gosh. And you, you, if, you, if you sing it that slowly as, as Petipa suggested in his time, the text would become completely unsingable, incomprehensible even. <laughs> yes. So what I think is that it's, it's time now that someone takes the score of Tchaikovsky mm -hmm. seriously as an artifice, as a, as a piece of music and a piece of musical theater mm -hmm. and makes a version of it, a danced version of it, which would adhere to the original idea of the composer. Yeah, and the speeds, um, absolutely. And yet, and yet tell this, the same story. It's, it's a very interesting point because when we work, okay, let, let's go back to the ballet version now. I'm, I'm, I've got my ballet hat now. So the, the version that is more recent, um, you know, which is the, as you say, the Petit Pas Ivanov. And, and it's a very interesting thing because we don't have the conductor that often in the studio and so we rehearse and then the conductor comes and bang you know and imposes a tempo or imposes or not or you know is told this is too fast you know and and it's an interesting point because obviously during my career I so wanted a uh, much more connection with the conductor there is some things where one could not execute the steps at certain speed, it's true. And also sizes matter and I happen to be a tall girl, but, it's, um, but it was mainly the fact that the thought process wasn't linked from the beginning. And so my idea and what I had created my storyboard uh, was different to the conductor's storyboard. And you know, hearing you say, this is, you know, this is my story, this is what I want to tell. 
And I had rehearsed my story and this is what I want to tell. And at no point we came close or, or even in a parallel line. Um, so it was trying to find the links that will you know, connect us throughout the performance. I think I, at, at points I did think, I wish someone challenged me a little more, you know, and so I could, I could um, just change my thought process a little bit, you know, let, let's try something new. Equally, I've never done a new version of Swan Lake, but I think that would be, that would be the, the step forward. There, there has been, you know, the male version of Swan Lake. This, the, of course, Swan Lake has been redone quite a few times, especially with new, completely new choreography. And some people have, I think, have taken uh, much more of the original scores than, than what it was, you know, what we ended up. But um, so I think, especially when there is no dancers, dancers involved, I think, I think the conductor should be as, as honest as possible, but, you know, towards the, the composer's wishes. Um, Absolutely, but what, what, I, what I also wanted to, to uh, lead, lead it, to point it, is that Tchaikovsky, in his complete lack of experience with ballet, which mm. was testified by many people that Tchaikovsky didn't know much about ballet when he started writing um, Swan Lake. Yeah. He created something revolutionary for its time, because I, mm. think, I think this is like a silent opera. Yeah. The piece is a piece of music theater and the symphonic piece at the same time. If you take his ideas for the face value and, and not try to embellish or adapt them to the taste of the time, which was, you know, taste of 1870s. For instance, all the codas in the big uh, pas de trois and pas de six, um, sometimes in, in the uh, Pas de Deux, in the Sobechanska Pas de Deux, mm -hmm. the chordas are meant to be played really fast. Mm -hmm. And if you play, for instance, um, I think it's the end of Pas de Trois in Act One. Ba -ba, ba -ba. If you play it at this speed, without it, thinking of the 32 forte. That you would be dead meat. <laughs> but, but, but then the music becomes something else. Yes. The music becomes something else. It becomes what was common at the time and what was pop music of the time. It becomes Kan Kan. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky knew Offenbach and Offenbach already wrote all his Kan Kans by 1877. Right. So this music is a very flashy, flamboyant, mm. um, evil, if you want, Kan Kan. Yeah. But then Kan Kan, uh, the movement of the Kan Kan has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. Mm. So to me, uh, this is a typical case of, and I know, again, I'm, I know I'm treading on a very thin ice here, speaking to one of the best dancers in the world about the classical choreography. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm uh, sacrificing all the holy cows at once. <laughs> uh, but... To me, it's a case of a misinterpretation mm. by the original choreographer who did not hear the Kan Kan in the music or didn't want to hear it and yeah. made it into something else. But it is like as though you would take a waltz and yeah. choreograph it as a march. Mm. Yeah. It's not sensical. And Kan Kan was a dance which was often used uh, again by people like Offenbach as a mean of parody. Right. And then we are again on, on, on this subject of the music theater. When Verdi writes flashy and what we call bad taste music in his operas like in Traviata, why do you think he does it or in Rigoletto? Because he was a bad composer? I would say not because mm -hmm. he wasn't. And we know when he wanted, he could write very, very sensitive and incredibly touching music but sometimes he needed for stage purposes something of a really bad taste mm -hmm. in order to represent certain strata the character. society yeah. char character etc mm -hmm. i claim that tchaikovsky does exactly the same he does it intuitively rather than deliberately because mm -hmm. uh, obviously if you read the original libretto it's all quite naive 
there is no deep psychology, no psychoanalysis. There is no Freud in it. Um, mm. There is no Shakespeare in it either. Yeah. Um, but intuitively, Tchaikovsky created something which was way ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that Matthew Bourne, with his very flamboyant version of, of, of the piece, comes perhaps no, closer, sir, yeah. to, the, to the nature of Tchaikovsky's uh, mm -hmm. soul. You know, Tchaikovsky, who did not believe in happiness on earth, Tchaikovsky, who did not believe that two souls, two people who meet in this world could be happy together, because obviously he, he would never be happy with a woman and mm -hmm. he could not be happy with a man because it, it wasn't allowed by, mm -hmm. by the society rules and standards. So yeah, yeah. for him, the, the tragic outcome of this story was pre-programmed. It was clear he, he, he didn't want to uh, invent a happy end, which he didn't believe in. Yeah. So in my opinion, of all three ballets, the first one is the least artificial and the most honest one. It's, I'm not saying it's the best music, because obviously uh, by the time he, he wrote Nutcracker, his compositional skills were at the complete height. Mm -hmm. um, but Swan Lake has got something incredibly touching and I would say heartbreaking, yes. which is comparable to such operas of his as um, Yevgeny Onegin or his Fourth Symphony. This works he wrote in the same, around the same time. They are the most romantic and the most tragic in a way. Mm. Like uh, Verdi's Traviata, which is probably also not his best piece, not his most mature piece, but his most heartbreaking piece. Yeah. And yeah, it's yeah, also yeah. from the middle period. Yeah. I so Odette, Odette as a protagonist, as a, as, a, as a figure, is not dissimilar to uh, Violetta Valerie. Mm -hmm. She puts everything at stake when she gives Prince her trust and eventually she loses he loses too but but this is this is very similar very similar drama as as in as in Dumas that is interesting you're talking about the third act the sort of can the coda section because I oh it, it always struck me you know okay yeah there is always a coda where you have to be flashy and that's the thing the coda for us in the ballet world is a flashy number is where you suddenly go okay so you know circus here we go and um and this is what i can do and this is what i can do and nobody can do this you know this is basically what you're saying and in a way it's always been the most vulgar side of dancing and because it's when you show the tricks and we know tricks are useful but not necessarily art and uh and so i always always thought oh you know i wish that wasn't there because it's only tricks for the sake of tricks. But the, the interesting bit about the Swan Lake, at, at least the versions that I have done, is that when it comes to the coda, you know, the black swan, uh, Odile, she really starts lowering her, her bra straps, basically. Mm -hmm. That's how, you know, she starts with those poetes, which, you know, now that you say can, can I think, oh God, yeah, of course, it's another version of a can, can because that's what you do. That's the leg just goes bam, 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 bam. So that's all you do. But then at the end, she chooses to do these diagonals and in every diagonal, her shoulder straps come down mm. a little bit further and a little bit further till the end. And that finale where she basically, he kisses her. That's, mm. that's how far in front of everyone. So it's as if, pleasure for the sake of pleasure wins above love and um and I always wondered you know how you know the prince how stupid oh he well you know the story is that he thinks is the white swan but how can he think is the white swan she's completely you know she comes in a mini dress you know kind of uh show showcasing everybody um there is no purity in her and yes, at one point, you know, that some, some productions do it as you keep a spell, you know, they create a spell and, and that's it. For me, the spell was always the spell of, you know, her perfume, 
basically. The, the spell was very sexual, right. you know, instead of just... Uh, she is the spell. She is the spell. She is that woman that, you know, makes you go, oh, my God, you know, whatever she does, it's, it's perfect for him. So, again, the purity, the, you know, this is the Don Giovanni story. The, the bodies will always win. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder, you know, as you said, you were talking about the third act and the coda. And she basically, you know, is, is the trickery, the, the circus, the vulgarity of the whole thing just comes till he agrees and, and kisses her in front of everyone. That's where the, 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 the whole thing ends pretty much in a kiss. Mm, I mean, we is so, so close to life where people that, made mistakes like that. That's, and they that's, have exactly, to apologize. Think, that's exactly what I think Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky mm. does. He creates something which is on the brink of vulgarity, of bad taste, mm -hmm. but which is really close to life. It's not about visualizing every number but you you just start following his logic it's the same in the symphony symphonies are abstract symphonies have no program and yet there is always some kind of inner program in Tchaikovsky's works mm -hmm. so you start seeing your own film your own inner film with the music and this inner film mostly leads to a tragedy you know when when things are at their most beautiful and at, at, the, at, at, at their purest, yeah. they are at their most breakable, at their most vulnerable. Mm. The distance between the, the pure and the impure grows in Tchaikovsky's works the older he becomes. So if you think of something like uh, Nutcracker, the evil uh, gets the most disgusting embodiment in forms of rats. They're not mice, they're rats. And it's like the, the whole dichotomy of life and entropy. So the entropy becomes visible. It's like a black hole eats into the living flesh. And I think it's got to do with Tchaikovsky's very difficult relationship with the religion. He was an agnostic who uh, always sympathized with Christianity because of the figure of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But he did not believe in the afterlife. He could also not believe in the redemption from his sins because he knew how sinful he, he was. You know, this whole attraction to, to young boys devoured his soul. He knew it was sinful. He knew it was bad. And yet he couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. So if you take uh, the story from, from this perspective, um, then Prince and Odette are both doomed from the start mm -hmm. for Tchaikovsky. And, and he, he sets up the, the situation so that we start empathizing with them, feeling with them, in order to then destroy it. So it's, it's, it's almost a sadomasochistic act of destruction of what you love most. That's yeah. what he does. And he does it in every piece. He does it in every piece. He spares Clara in, uh, or Marie in, in, in uh, uh, Nutcracker. And he spares also the characters of uh, the Sleeping Beauty. But that's why I'm saying these two ballets, uh, great they are musically, they are the most artificial. They are quite far removed from the real life. While mm -hmm. Swan Lake stands in the middle of real life. Mm -hmm. And the fantastical subject from the from the times of uh, medieval knights is but a pretext. It's only decor. It's a piece of uh, scenery. So if you look behind this piece of scenery, it's like with Wagner and his Nibelungs. Mm -hmm. You know, the setting of it in the prehistorical times is only a way um, to tell a very modern story and to criticize the modern society. Bernard Shaw said it about Wagner's Ring. So to me, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake stands not very far away from Wagner's Ring. It's a massive criticism on the, on the society in which he lived. And also a, a very personal take on the subject of human happiness, on um, subject of broken promises, 
and illusions and delusions. Yes. It's interesting because I always thought that the prince, I never felt at the beginning sorry for the prince because for some reason he really neutralizes the prince completely while the swan immediately, you see her, her, I think maybe with the music, the moment he, you know, he puts those, uh, the, the oboe at the beginning, as you said, in her entrance, that's it. It's like, bam, right into your chest. While the prince is just like, dun, 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 you know, you, you don't feel sympathy for him to start with. Well, for Schilling, Schilling, it was obviously the other way around because he ascribed in, in this Tom Schilling version I spoke about before, he ascribed yeah. the opening melody yeah. He ascribed it to Prince. Prince. Right. It started with the image of the Prince playing with a handkerchief, which is like the last memory of his father. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, it's not completely wrong because this theme is not the theme of the swan. No. It was in the opposite direction. The, the theme of this one is T. It's a falling fifth, then ascending and filling out the scale. Yeah. The starting theme the is, is the other way around. It's all doomed. <laughs> yeah. It's this, all, all the way down. And then ta di ra di ta di ra di, but the first melody is directed downwards. Yes, yes. The, the second melody is, I mean, you might say it's the same key. It starts from the same note, but I would say Prince and Odette for Tchaikovsky, if you interpret it this way, mm -hmm. are two sides of the same person. Mm -hmm. Yes, would have made a complete person the two of them mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's an interesting thing. I had never thought it that him way. With, him with his solitude, her with her solitude. Yeah. That this is a very bold interpretation, of course, and, and we are weighing hot air because there is nothing in the music that proves it. But we know that mm. the prince in the original libretto is not very happy at yeah. the prospect of marriage. And he goes to the lake in order to forget his sorrows. Then he suddenly meets this woman. So there might be some, at least some melancholy associated with the prince and some kind of a dream, you know, a daydream, which, which, he, which he would like to live, but he doesn't know how to live it. And, and this is um, the tragedy of two people meeting at the, at the, at the wrong junction. I would yeah. genuinely think that the the start of the overture has nothing to do with the swan it's something to do with the human longing for a dream yeah as a matter of fact i think most of that one well the prologue i don't know depending on what you i think it's very terrenal earthly it's it's all about you know duties yeah and then suddenly he cuts and, and goes somewhere yeah. he takes it somewhere else mm. and, and act three is all about evil yeah this is yeah. The, the, the all the national dances in the pas de six mm. and the russian dance this is like the display of evil at, at its most flamboyant this is this is the what differs tchaikovsky from delib you know he was a big admirer of delib and in a way his swan lake would have been impossible without delib's coppelia which mm. was created before. But if you compare the national dances as yeah. they are said by Delib and as they're said by Tchaikovsky, Delib is, is a sweetie. He is adoring them all. And but Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky writes such a cutting edge, unpleasantly cutting edge music, where you think there is devil in it. I suddenly remembered that in the Burmeister version, which I grew up with, the prologue. Uh, describe the spell of Rothbard as it falls on Odette. So now I suddenly remember that the piece in Burmeister's version started with Odette as a girl, as a, as yes. a 
human being taking a walk at the lake. That's right. And then being attacked by by Rothbard and turned into a swan. Yeah. But, um, is it is it the same in in the, in the original Petit Pas? Again, I'm not sure about the original, but everybody takes it takes liberties in there. Very often, that is the case. She is walking, and you can see Rothbard, you know, just yeah. turns her into a swan. I quite like the fact that we don't have that mm. because I feel it's too chewed up for us. You know, it's like, I'm gonna to explain to you what happened. I, I rather the abstraction of this woman who appears. I think also when you go and see Swan Lake, you kind of have a, you know, a rough idea of, of the story. So you don't need to be so specific of why, but, but I think, yes, I think if you go back, I think many, many people going back to the original have done that. Uh, so it must be mm. somehow shown in the original. I, I like the abstraction. I, I like the fact that you have to think a little bit more as a member of the audience. More like a child would accept something abstract as a matter of fact. But as I said before, to me, the music has um, iron cast logic to it. Mm. An inner logic and maybe an abstract logic. As Stravinsky once said, the music cannot express but itself. Music cannot express any feelings. You identify certain feelings in the music. You can ascribe certain feelings to the music, but the music itself is um, art of black dots on the white sheet of paper, which creates certain constellations, which when resounding has a strong effect on, on the human spirit. So if we analyze just the music as it is, both musically and emotionally. I think Tchaikovsky dictates a certain set of rules. He says, this music, this type of music, I want you to take for the face value. This type of music, I want to see only as a facade. But on, of course, in order to do it, you need to study. It's like studying a new language. So to me, um, it's impossible to, to take Swan Lake independently from the rest of Tchaikovsky's oeuvre. If you study all of his music, all his piano compositions, his quartets, his songs, his operas, and his symphonies, then I think you have a, a, a better understanding of, of what it is. For instance, the, the key of B minor in which the piece starts and ends. Well, it ends with a B major, but we know that this B, B major is a very black one, very dark one. The B minor for Tchaikovsky was the same key uh, in which he set his last symphony. Symphony Pathétique is in the B minor. Right. I didn't realize uh, that. Queen of Spades starts yeah. in B minor. And there are moments of B minor in the Nutcracker and uh, the Carabos theme from, the, from which the Sleeping yeah. Beauty starts. That's all B minor. So B minor is very, very dark. Mm -hmm. It's not romantic. It's dark. It's black. Yeah. It's the key of depression. It's the, the opposite. You know, so someone like Tchaikovsky... This is not me saying it. it was one of the Russian musicologists, but a, a very, very famous one, Igor Glebov, or Boris Asafiev was actually his real name. He said that for Tchaikovsky, the death was not the end, a natural, sad, but a natural end of a life. For Tchaikovsky, the death was an active evil force which was opposing itself to life, which was devouring life. Mm. Right. So it was like this entropy, this black hole, which ate into the into the living flesh. So he was afraid of death as he would be afraid of of devil or of, of evil. The, he he identified those things. He for, for him they they became one. This is this is the opposite of the Christian approach because mm -hmm. for, for Christians the death is the liberation. Salvation. Yeah, exactly. And potential salvation. But for Tchaikovsky, it was it was a black end of all things. And if, if you think that the, the Swan Lake starts in the final key, it makes you think.
you're right. You're absolutely right. He starts doomed already. So it, it, very interesting that he thought that l the walk of life was not a walk of life, but a walk of death, like, as if he was already aiming. So I'm hoping our performance, it would, would create a little bit of a um, discussion <laughs> among the <laughs> ballet lovers, but I hope that it would um, give people another perspective on, on, on the piece, uh, on this genius score. And maybe I will live up to the point where one choreographer comes up to me and says, let's do the piece together. Because I have always avoided, I have conducted a lot of ballets, but I've always avoided conducting Tchaikovsky's ballets exactly because of that point, because I could see the beauty of the original choreography, but I could see what deteriorating effect it had on the music. And I just could not take heart in uh, becoming complicit in, in, in this annihilation of Tchaikovsky's original plans. So as a musician, I just couldn't, I couldn't. It's, it's an interesting one. I think, I think you're right. I think once you've, you've discovered the Holy Grail, why go back to a normal glass? Once I was doing Swan Lake and this conductor who shall not be named um, came to see it. And in the end, we called each other and, and he said, oh, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. But I had to leave after act three because it was like watching a butchery. <laughs> and I thought it really made me laugh because I, I had never thought it from a point of view of a conductor. <laughs> Sorry to be absolutely ballet bun. But of course, I had never really I thought oh he'll be watching the movement and but of course his ear was was all to do with the music and the orchestration and the la la and he was so against what was happening in the cha chamber that he had to leave <laughs> I felt okay about it because I thought well yeah you know he obviously as you say music first well music or, or composers ideas I mean if this is this is the question what was what came before the egg or, or the hen um, for me Tchaikovsky is the actual parent of mm. this he's the sole parent because the libretto was created by Begichev but following his wishes mm -hmm. and Tchaikovsky dreamed up this ballet yeah. and then came the movement but you if you listen to the music and I don't know if you if you can switch off all the the inner film but just listen to the music as though you've never heard it before and i have to say once again hear it at the right speed at the speed yes. which is more coherent with the with the other works of the same composer yeah it suggests all kinds of new movements to you and also it tells the that's the the, the miracle of, of the score the score tells the story yeah without words. You know, it, the, the, this was created about 40 years before, 50 years before the film came into being as a genre, as, a, as an art form. But to me, it's, it's like I was watching a, a fantastic movie. Listen to the score. Yeah. Listen to the score with the libretto in the hand. Mm -hmm. So yes. not, not knowing what the piece is about, what the story is, and just follow the music. The music is all but abstract. It's not abstract. It's purely theatrical. Mm. It's pure theater, but it's theater of a kind which you find in Verdi, which you find in Wagner. It uses uh, the various forms, like, for instance, of these set dances, in order to express something else. So there is this, this deep psychological level underneath. You hear walls, but you can also hear this whole routine of the court and, and the heartlessness of the court. Yeah. And you hear another waltz and you, you, uh, the waltz of the swans, and you hear the, their sorrow, you hear their burden, which they're carrying with them, being slaves of this, of this evil person, magician, don't know who. By the way, in the original, uh, Rothbard was not the sole devil. He was devil's emissary. He was, ah. the, he was only appearing at the ball as the, as the evil demon with Odilia. 
but the actual devil is this owl, which is, uh, in fact, Odette's stepmother. Okay, so, so, I gosh. So the owl waking over the swans, and the owl which remains there until the end is is the evil stepmother. She is the actual black magician, and Roth von Rothbard is one of her emissaries. She sends him to the ball with this clone oh. of Odette. Yes. To seduce the prince and 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 to make him break the promise. So there, there are two, not one. Yes, that's interesting. I never knew how, I wonder how that worked. Yeah, oh my God, this is quite tricky now. This is too many relationships now with stepmothers, you know, all kinds of... Well, in um, the original libretto, I don't have it in English, but um, it's, it says in, in Russian, Odette talking to, to the prince at the lake. She says this, my name is Odette. My mother was a good fairy. Against the will of her father, she loved Knight, married him, but she perished because of him and she died. My father, this Knight, married another one and forgot me. And the evil stepmother, who was also a witch, who hated me wholeheartedly and nearly killed me. Uh, and then my grandfather took me at his house and my grandfather loved my mother dearly. And he was so sad when she died that he kept crying real tears. And from his tears uh, came this lake. Gosh. From the tears Gosh. of my grandfather came the lake and he, went down to the bottom of the lake and hid me there from people. So only recently my grandfather started allowing me to go out and have some fun. During the day, my friends, my girlfriends and I, we turn into swans and then we can fly high almost to the sky. And at night we dance and play down here near my grandfather but my stepmother still doesn't leave me in peace neither me nor my girlfriends at that moment we hear the owl cry do you hear that's her evil voice says Odette looking around look that's her and then on the ruins of the castle appears a, a gigantic owl with the um, yeah. uh, flashing eyes she would have killed me long ago, uh, continues Odette, but my grandfather watches her very attentively and doesn't allow her to harm me. When I get married, the witch will lose the opportunity to harm me, but until I am married, only this crown saves me from her evil. <laughs> and this is the crown which prince at the end of the story when Od uh, in act four when odette wants to leave the prince and says no i i cannot forgive you it's 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 over he tears the crown from her head and throws it into the lake and then she says what have you done now i'm unprotected uh, eventually they both die but you see, the story which Tchaikovsky had in mind when composing was actually far more complex than what we know. Absolutely. That, that makes, wow. That's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, fascinating, actually. That makes more sense than just a, you know, a random swan, just like that. She puts huge hopes in this prince. Mm. He might be her salvation. Yeah. That's why she entrusts herself to him. Would have she met, uh, you know, other people? Or was he the first one? Do you know what I mean? Um, she met other people before, but she liked him. She, she said that I fell in love with you. Yeah. Because the other swans wanted to harm him because mm. he, came, he came with the, with the, with the rifle. Yeah. yeah. With a gun. And yeah. he, 
he he destroyed the gun in front of them and said, from now on, I'm not going to harm a, a single bird. Yes, yes, yes. And yeah. she said, don't touch him. You see, he's a good one. And that's the, the first the first entrance over that, what we hear, that recitative of the oboe. Tchaikovsky overwrites above the oboe melody. Odette says, don't harm him. You okay. see, he is, he is not evil. He's good, etc. So he followed the, his own script. It's interesting because now we've changed that into much later. After after da di da di da 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 di da di da di da di da da that's when the swans are trying to get him him to to you know the the um, crossbow and then she says da di da di di da da di da da which is saying please please you know and then says to them that's you know he's he's okay he's he's obviously obliged uh, but so he's very very short. Yeah. Uh, the new version is, and, and I, I always thought it was so quick to say, okay, okay, and everybody goes, okay, <laughs> she says it's fine. But of course, it makes more sense the beginning because it's a much longer, yeah. Oh, that's so, it's fascinating, you know, I, I had no idea. How interesting it is for me to hear you because you are, you know, as a conductor, you go in depth to the nature, to the words, to the feeling, to everything of the composer. So you are basically the one who's going trans to, to transpose the work of the composer as honestly as possible, to interpret the work. While as a dancer, I'm just another, another tool. So it, it's, it becomes very a very different ob objective angle, I think, to the music. But don't you um, think that the, the work of the choreographer um, is actually not dissimilar to the work of the conductor? The choreographer has to interpret what the composer and the librettist have created. Ideally, they should collaborate. The composer, the, li the librettist, and the choreographer. In, in operatic terms, it's the director. In this particular case of the Swan Lake, the difficulty is that Tchaikovsky was creating the ballet on his own, and the first performance of it was not um, a remarkable achievement of, of a, uh, in a, a dance theater history. The one which became a remarkable achievement came after Tchaikovsky's death. So we yeah. can only imagine what the piece would have become had Petit Pas been part of the original production from the start. Absolutely. Because speaking of, of the Nutcracker, uh, Tchaikovsky created it specially for Petit Pas. And so as a result, you do not need to change one note in the original score. The same with the Sleeping Beauty, though Sleeping Beauty is so long that sometimes you can abridge certain amount of set numbers. And yet the narrative is told in a very certain way. With the Swan Lake, it became uh, a totally different story because Petit Pas took the liberty of taking this ballet apart. And Petit Pas was, of course, a great choreographer, yet he was not Tchaikovsky. And in my opinion, with his taste, which was very much the taste of his time, I'm not speaking of the movements, I'm speaking of the sense of drama, sense of timing of drama and the necessity for contrast, et cetera, et cetera. He remained very much in the 19th century, while Tchaikovsky's score looks right into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So from Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, you can draw a direct line to Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. to Hans's Undine, and to so many other ballets which were created later. But those later ballets were theatrically much more lively and interesting yeah. yes. than, yeah. than the, these creations of the 19th century. So I, I, feel, I feel there is a, a, a real conflict there because the music is not of the 19th century. The music, well, you could say it's timeless, but the music is looking ahead mm -hmm. and the choreography is looking backwards. It's, on, it's only in, in the case of the Swan Lake. With other ballets, it's much more harmonic. Act two is quite set in its structure and it was actually not 
violated by by Petit Pai Ivanov at all. They ah, left interesting. Them. But Act Four, there is this extra pas de deux. Yes. Which is based upon the Tchaikovsky piano pieces. Right. It was n never part of the. If you play the original Act Four of Swan Lake, the way Tchaikovsky wrote it, it has a duration of seventeen minutes. It's the shortest act. This it really short. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. To me, it's like a piece of symphonic music. Yes. So when you hear it in our version, you will be surprised because there is this whole slow bit missing in the middle, which yeah. Tchaikovsky didn't think was necessary. So it means that the fourth act for him was pure drama. There were no set dances at all. Gosh. And uh, That's so interesting. But Petipa thought that he needed another duet between the Odette and Prince. Yeah. He asked the conductor, composer, conductor Drigo to take up Tchaikovsky's piano pieces and orchestrate them mm -hmm. and inserted them. But they are to me like a foreign body inserted in, inside something very genuine. Um, and the other thing which I think was a big, I mean, it was a big coup, of course, and it, it was also, you could say, a flash of genius to take the pas de deux from Act One transmit it, transport it into Act 3 yeah. and make it the Black Swan Pas de Deux. Yeah. But I think if you take the original Sobyshanskaya Pas de Deux, the one which Tchaikovsky wrote following the structure of Minkus, Minkus yeah. Petit Pas, that is a good substitute for, for the Black Swan in Act 3. You just need to find an explanation what is this so-called Black Swan the music is doing in Act One. So in Act One, the way Tchaikovsky composed it needs much more input from any choreographer today if you mm -hmm. want to do it in the original version because it, it stops being a divertimento, a, a divertissement of set pieces. There needs to be some kind of an inner narrative. Yes. And that's why Schilling invented this Gonzago play story with the killing of uh, yeah. Hamlet's father, the prince's father, etc. Yeah. Et you yeah. need to invent something to justify the presence of the Black Swan in Act One. Yes, yes, of course. Because it makes total sense. Musically, it makes total sense. And also, one, one other thing which, which people forget about, that the White Swan Pas de Deux in... Um, original Tchaikovsky. That's the one thing which they did change in Petit Pas. Oh. It has a, another coda. Oh. The White Swan Pas de Deux. That strange, brittle ending, yes, which is not in the classical version, there is a, a huge psychological truth in it because we know that Odette doesn't trust Prince straight away. Mm. She has inhibitions. So if you think that she opened up in course of their duet, then suddenly she closes again and, and becomes this brittle, unearthly creature which rejects anything yeah. human and anything male. And so it takes Prince another attempt and another vow uh, that she trusts him entirely. And it only happens later in Act Two. Yeah. yeah. That's an interesting take. It's interesting because I always thought, well, that's a funny coda here it, because I did that version too. Yeah. I, I, and I couldn't quite, it was like, oh, oh. That, that comes out of nowhere. <laughs> it, dictates, it dictates certain certain em emotional undertone. Yes. And I think I think Tchaikovsky is always right there. Like Verdi, Verdi also, yeah. you know, Verdi hated cabalettas. Cabaletta is in operatic world what you call coda. It's exactly yes. the same. Yes. He hated them, but he knew they were necessary. And they always displayed a different not the soulful, not the, the inner, it's more the flashy, the outside part That's of the right. personality yeah. of whoever it is. And, and so in case of Violetta Valeri, her cabaletta, Sempre Libera, is 
okay, I'm I'm fine. I'm going to be fine. I just yeah. go with life. I don't want to know about my illness. I don't know to know, I not don't want to know about how miserable yeah. I feel. That's composing yourself, getting yourself together, and going yeah. through life. That's also there is psychological truth in it as well. Totally, totally, absolutely. He must have felt that what like we all do, don't we? We all put this face in, you know. Yeah. And, Interesting. So, what part? What musically? What part? What is the third uh, act? Part of the bum, 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 is that the one that it then is in Act One? That's in Act One now. Right. And in Act Three, the part of the goes like this it starts that's it that's it that's it and then you have the male variation is that's the male, that's the male. Yeah. then comes the female and then there comes the coda yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had heard that that was taken out of Swan Lake. Something else had been put in. Another, another of his works had been put in. That's it. And, and then that, that, and that now has become something called che in the dance world. It's called Tchaikovsky Padada, and it's it's a Balanchine <laughs> version of you know Chaipa as we call it, yeah. and. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful, that is nothing to do, not, nothing to do with Swan Lake. It's, it's just completely that's, thing. That's, different. that's what he composed for the for the dancer Sobichanska oh. instead of me, because she wanted to do Minkus. Yeah. And that was the insert in Act 3 instead of what's today the Black Swan Party do. So that's, that's Od Odilia's solo and her seduction of the prince. Yeah, yeah, of course, it makes it makes sense. First of all, we do it with the LPO and we do it as a purely, purely musical rendition. And also what we want to do in this video presentation, we want to bring in super titles from the original libretto. At points where Tchaikovsky does it in his score, we will highlight the, the super titles so that people can follow the music with this storyline as, mm. as Tchaikovsky had it in mind. I think that's a very good idea. Otherwise, I, you, you'll have people like me going, huh? <laughs> okay. you know, I thought that was the other. I thought that meant this. And yeah, yeah. yeah. we've been imposed this version for so long that we can't detach our, our brains I, from. I completely sympathize with that. But yeah. I, I managed after also after having lived with the other version as a, as a yeah. child and as a teenager, but yeah. um, I managed to detach myself and found the original version so much more interesting and uh, uh, to my liking that um, I, I now wouldn't, I would never give it up. You wouldn't go back, right? Yeah.